Hello. Nobody in yet. Hi, Shane. We'll start again in a second. Uh, so you and I have the same first name. Where are you based? Okay. Uh, KO. Okay. Okay. Are you uh Are you working by day and um, study I think we get started anyway. Okay. All right. So, uh, what I'm not going to do this time is I'm not going to use the YouTube, but there's two of them there. Okay. Studying full time. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I'm not going to. There's a two YouTubes there, um, which what I will do is I will talk with Anthony and I will send links on or upload a page with, with the links onto them. So I'm not going to try and run those YouTubes today to be figured out what went wrong in the last class. Uh, but they're quite illustrative ones, so they're, they're useful. So we'll, we'll, we'll I'll talk about them. So um, I talked about this at the start of the last class, and this is the YouTube that's uh, or one of the YouTube that didn't work. Um, and I, we talked about the importance of 1984 as an advertisement, as a communications tool. Um, we talked about marketing as the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, and satisfying customer requirements profitably. So we're in the business of making profits generally. Uh, and uh, Marketing is challenging because there's no one best way to be a market focused company. Uh, customers are humans, most of them, uh, and organizations are run by humans. So this is this gives rise to some of the limitations of our marketing because humans, by definition, are both complex and somewhat inconsistent in spite of our best efforts. Marketing is also challenging because beyond needs, and we talked about needs, wants, and demands last week, emotions play a bigger part of the buyer decision-making process. That should be in buyer decision-making. Okay, so that was a recap on, on last week. Uh, and we had that example about, uh, you know, what, what, are these, what are these guys selling? Well, Coca-Cola, obviously. Are they selling... Uh, are they selling a drink? Yes, it's a drink. But what are they really selling? Well, they're not selling uh, liquid for your body because that's what your body needs. They're selling a, a momentary refreshment, okay? Because you're getting that 
sugar normally it's it's cold coke you're getting that sugar hit you're getting that taste so it's that sort of um boost that they're selling so i don't know if you have sausages in malaysia but certainly there's a there's are sausages which are like a, a meat a processed meat product in europe uh and one of the companies here denny's was uh, and famously made the statement that you know people don't buy sausages they buy the sizzle you know the sizzle when this these meat products are being fried uh and you get that sort of sense coming off of them so coca-cola is not selling a wet drink it's selling a you know a refreshing moment that's what it's selling uh and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about coke again uh, next week or the week after um well i asked you i gave you a task last week to look at comparing the marketing approach of two companies and i suggested possibly air malaysia and uh I forget what the name of the other uh, Malaysian airline was. But for example, I also did put a simple example here around Apple and Samsung. So if you compare the marketing approaches of the two companies, in some ways, we think they're quite similar. Um, but let's just peel back for a minute and realize that Apple is in a consumer electronics market, mainly for PCs, phones, and some devices, as well as some other solutions like uh, entertainment. Samsung is a much broader multinational conglomerate. It's into a range of things, from phones and uh, consumer electronics, electronics to things uh, which are much, much bigger. Uh, so it's a bit of bigger engineering. It makes ships, for example. Apple is not in the shipmaking business. So the needs and wants and demands of the customers are different. When they're in the same market, they are similar. So there's for individuals with phones, then they're talking about similar types of needs and wants. Um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of individuals and their and the connection that the company makes, and Apple drives on that connection and on coolness, you know, to a certain extent. This this idea of the think different that I mentioned in the last class. Um, Samsung will have different approaches for individuals and for organizations. So if it's selling ships, it's going to have a totally different approach to ships as it is to to phones. Now, its phones approach will be somewhat similar to Apple's because they are direct competitors in many ways. There's only a couple of variations, which are obviously Android versus the iOS and that sort of system-based approach and the and the effect. But, you know, it's a phone, it's a, it's a diary, it's a camera, it's a media playing device, no matter whether it's an iPhone or, or a Samsung Galaxy. Uh, and they have appropriately products or services in those various markets that they're dealing with. So Apple has PCs, etc. Samsung has has far better pharmacies, ships, and phones, and also into in uh, communications in terms of um, semiconductors, semiconductor chips. Um, Apple absolutely has very much a marketing orientation, and we talked about production, product, sales, and marketing orientations last week. Apple very much a marketing orientation. Um, as does Samsung when it comes to to phones uh, 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 and and consumer electronics. Honestly, I have no knowledge about what their orientation is like in terms of ships. I assume, I'm assuming it's a marketing to a certain extent as well, as with Bio Farm, although that might be also research focused. Uh, we're not going to talk about the marketing mix of these two companies because first of all, they are the scale is different, as I said, from Apple to Samsung. Um, and it's something we'll, we'll come back to again. But I asked you to do that then looking at the airline. So I'm hoping you had a chance to look at that uh, and that you saw some differences between Air Malaysia and uh, Air X, was it? <clears throat> um, another example, if you were to compare much closer, our, 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 uh, I'd say a discount retailer and a specialist store. You know, what's the market? For example, for a discount retailer, customers are looking for bargain prices. Whereas for a specialist store, customers are looking for specific solutions okay so the specialist store could be a, a footwear store a high-end footwear store it could be a uh, a game store okay um the needs wants and demands of the customers from the discount retailer but more than like it's a cost focus they're looking for value for money they want to make each cent go further uh whereas in a specialist store um, there's a specific need that they're trying to, to resolve. So maybe it's a personal need or maybe they're looking for a specific thing for somebody else. So it could be an antiques store, an antique silver, very, very special store. And the uh, the discount re re retailer, normally the product or service providers, the broad range of generic, very cost competitive because the orientation is a cost focus. 
and their marketing mix will likely then be around generic mass media to get to as many of these uh, customers who are looking with a cost focus for value for money. Whereas the specialist store has proven solutions that it's providing, which are linked to that specialism. So its orientation is about a solution focus or a specific demand focus on that special specialization. So the marketing mix that it might apply, the communications it might apply will be in selected media. So where is it likely to get its message to the type of person who will want that store? Uh, sorry, just give me one second. Uh, so in terms of the tailored contact on specific media, okay? Uh, let me just turn that off so I don't get distracted. Um, so, you know, the purpose of this last couple of slides is to compare marketing from different types of organizations, somewhat similar in some ways, but to get a sense of that, you know, marketing should be around, about the customer, should be customer-based, which means that it drives choices in what uh, product or services are provided, how they're provided, how they're communicated, or how communication occurs about those products, services to those, to the target markets. So let's get back in into, into the module proper. So introduction to marketing. Last time I told you marketing is not advertising. This week I'm telling you marketing is not selling. It's much more than that. And we keep going back to that marketing orientation. Not production, not product, not selling, marketing orientation. Being clear on who the customer is and what their need is. Okay. Uh, and this is where I would like to... Uh, but so we'll deal with the module learning problem. So this week we're talking about understanding market research and planning and identifying how selected organizations use marketing research to develop a marketing plan. So what we're going to talk about is what market research, what is marketing research and why it's important to whom, and then what is a marketing plan. Before that, we kind of just need to position it by talking about marketing strategy. Before that, I'm going to show you this video here. I'm not going to play it because we lost uh, uh, sound the last time I did this in the last module. I am gonna send you the link, but I'm gonna, I'll tell you a bit about it. So this is a video for a company called Dollar Shave Club. The video comes from 2012. So Dollar Shave Club was a startup business and it used this business to leverage investor funding, okay? And the concept behind this business, Dollar Shave Club, well, it came about because this guy, who was one of the founders and another guy, were talking at a party. And one of the things that they talked about was the fact that, you know what, if you're a man, you know, sometimes you run out of razors, right? You know, razor blades. So this was a problem. You have to go out and buy a razor blade. Or what were the challenges in buying a razor blade? And that led to the concept for this business. Well, what if your razor blades were delivered to you? Okay. And the business model, really, really simple, but really, really uh, both effective and very smart. So the idea was it would be a subscription business where people would sign up and every month or two months, they would have blades delivered to their house. So they would sign up and they would say, here's what I want, and they would get it delivered, okay? So a bit like a buying club, the old style buying clubs in the past. Uh, now, the benefit of this was a couple, there was a couple of benefits to this, really, really quite useful benefits. Uh, one of which was, first of all, building a channel. So what they were competing, I mean, any of you who buy razors uh, will realize that, you know, you can spend anything from, you know, buy a dirt cheap razor blade to a high end, you know, supposedly high tech razor that will, you know, have four blades or five blades and shave closer and closer and et cetera, et cetera. So they made the point that, you know what, you don't have to spend all this money. You just need a razor. So what if we have a very standard basic razor and we just send you enough of them that because they're basic and cheap, you don't need to worry about the cost and it's cost to be low. And literally you pay for the packaging and we just send you out a batch all the time. So you never have to worry about buying razors or being out of razors again. Because simply they will arrive, they're in your house, so they'll be there. And you'll always have your little stock there. Really simple idea. So what this demonstrates is that they understood a bit about the marketplace. They understood that there were people for who, who wanted to buy, you know, high, 
want a really close shave, very, very effective close shave, and who are willing to buy the higher end products. And they also realized there are people who just needed to be able to shave uh, and sometimes forgot to buy razors and then had that extra chasing around or having to use an old razor or something and being frustrated. So they understood that there was differences in the marketplace and that people had different needs. And they reckoned, well, okay, we can target this group here with this particular need. But the secret in this or the secret benefit in this is that if they built this customer base and they got people to sign up and to buy in advance online to be to have their products delivered, they'd have a captured audience. And once they had a captured audience for razor blades, then they could put other things through the same channel. They could put toothpaste, toothbrush, uh, sprays, aftershave, all the toiletries through the same channel, the same concept. Not something that is perishable, not something that's breakable per se, something that has long life, light, low cost to ship. Really simple concept. And we built up a channel, so then they're able to push more through that channel. And what they did with this video then was they put a very simple, very humorous approach. So I'll send you a link and you can watch it. Or you can look up, uh, you can Google it and look at it on YouTube yourself, Dollar Shave Club, um, humorous. But they put money into this. So they had whatever money they got initially put into this, uh, they filmed it in somebody else's warehouse, by the way. It wasn't in their own warehouse. They filmed it in somebody else's warehouse, but it went viral. And on the back of that, they got subscribers coming in. And on the back of that, proving the model, they were able to go get more investor funding, more investor funding. Okay? Uh, so a very, very successful, successful business pitch uh, overall. Um, so let's go back. Uh, so that's Dollar Shave Club. Okay? And that's, that's an extract from its website. So definitely it's well worth watch. The video is about two, two and a half minutes. Well worth it. Have a look. Uh, you'll enjoy it, but you'll also get a sense of what the business is about. A new startup business started in 2012, um, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, there it is. In 2016, was acquired for $1 billion in cash. Okay? Simple idea, founded by Mark Levine and Michael. That's one of the two, let's see, the Mark and Michael in the video. Uh, spoke about their frustrations with the cost of razor blades. Um, got it up and running. March 2012 provided a million in funding. So they used that then with uh, for this, this video. I think the video came out in April 2012. Um, uh, and they built on, they just built on that. But there was that idea of building a channel. But the reason it worked is because they understood, they took a marketing orientation and they understood who the customer was. So they'd, they'd obviously they, the generation idea came up, but then they researched and they researched and they figured out, well, actually we could do it this way. So that's the lesson. Uh, so I'll let you learn about the Dollar Shave Club. And that brings us back to the core marketing concept. Again, I showed you this last week. It's about understanding what the needs and wants are and demands of the customer. What are the products and services that, that will satisfy those needs, wants, and demands? So if you think about Dollar Shave Club, the problem here was access to a razor when you needed it. Getting a razor, bog standard razor, when you need it. So the products and services wasn't so much the razor, it was having the razor available, having it delivered. And then the value and satisfa value satisfaction and quality was you never, you, as a customer, you'd never be without a razor, okay? Assuming you're at home. Uh, but uh, you, you, this thing was simply taken off your list. You didn't have to worry about buying them every now and then, right? Uh, obviously, some sort of exchange transaction, so you paid up front, you got your stuff delivered, that was it. Uh, and they built a market for this thing based on a marketing concept. Okay, based on being customer focused, customer centric. So, in terms of marketing strategy, <clears throat> so with many startup businesses, and a lot of startup businesses fail, remember. So, you know, one in 10 will be successful. Uh, maybe five or six in 10 will fail. And the other two or three will struggle uh, along for a while. But with all startup businesses, having a very good marketing strategy is really, really important. And, and the ones that succeed are the ones that have, have that marketing orientation and manage to get an effective marketing strategy. Doesn't mean they make they don't make mistakes, because they all do. But the same thing that applies for startups also applies for bigger organizations as well and established organizations. So what is a marketing strategy? Well, according to Michael Porter, who's the guru uh, in, in sort of competitive strategy, 
and competitive advantage. It's essentially a formula for how a business is going to compete. What its goals should be and what policies and plans, if you like, will be needed to carry out these goals. That's what a marketing strategy is. Okay. According to Philip Kotler, and we had we mentioned Kotler last week in terms of one of the definition, the marketing strategy lays out the target markets, target markets, and the value proposition that will be offered based on an analysis of the best market opportunity. Again, it's a market orientation. So marketing strategy then involves a plan. How are we going to compete? It also involves decisions about what markets to compete in and why we're going to compete in them. So there are some markets that it's not worth competing in. Uh, and even for the smallest business or for the largest businesses, sometimes there can be decisions made about markets to pull out. For example, um, Siemens are a massive German engineering company. They make power stations, they make trains, <coughs> they make washing machines, they make industrial washing machines. Big engineering company, German engineering company. Um, they pulled out of the market in Ireland in one particular area because they did not want to work with the state bodies that they would have to work with because they thought that actually working with those state bodies in Ireland, it simply wasn't effective. It wasn't worth it. It didn't really fit with how they did their business. So they decided, you know what, there's enough business elsewhere. We don't need that business. And they and they pulled out of that segment in, in, in Ireland. Um, so sometimes it's a question about deciding what markets to compete in. And if you're a startup business, one of the challenges to decide is, to, is not what markets to put out of, what markets to get into and what markets not to get into. So to be very specific about where, where you're going to. So um, I alluded to the organization I was working with in the last session. I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment around building up a licensing model. Um, one of the challenges there is to try and keep it simple in terms of the, vo in terms of the products that we try to get into this licensing arrangement. Well, I'll try to sell all these products into this new startup process or profile. We want to keep it simple, first of all, and get it moving so that we can then start to, to build on from there. So what markets to compete in and why? why? Why are we competing in those markets? Equally, a marketing strategy has to have goals and objectives. We need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve. And some of that can be difficult because it can, you know, how do you put a, a measure on some of this stuff? It, it, it could be, you know, that we want to achieve 10% of the market. Well, then we need to know what the market is. Is it 10% of volume? Is it 10% of value? Um, we need to know who else has market share because that would help us in terms of who we're targeting. We need to figure out what policies will be adopted and, and applied. You know, what's our squeal point? What will we not do? What sort of quality are we going to bear? What, what sort of approach are we going to sell at all costs or are we going to make time you know, factoring our reputation into this as well. And most importantly, defining what the value proposition is. And I think that's crucial. If we don't have a value proposition, we're not really in the right marketplace. Uh, and there's a book, um, I don't have it here in front of me, uh, on uh, the Lean Startup, the Lean Startup Canvas, which is, um, which is very much a marketing orientation approach to define the value proposition and getting to a startup as, as, as effectively as possible, as quickly as possible. And so based on the idea that you fail fast. So work out what not, what, you know, determine what's not working and don't do that anymore. Uh, try and focus on what is working and make sure that that's tied into the value proposition. Um, so along with that, we might have, uh, we also need to look at a basis of analysis of marketing opportunities. Um, okay. So, Building on that market research, we need to talk about market. We talk about market research and marketing research. So the first level in any of this is understanding the external environment. So this is a, more of a strategic planning tool, but the same thing applies in market and marketing research. What's going on outside in the world, outside of our business? So the 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 traditional model is called a pest or a pestel. Really, we need to look at our business and figure out what's happening in the political, economic, the social the technolo technology, the environment, and the legal worlds that impacts on our business. <clears throat> it's not what are we doing. It's what's happening that could impact on our business. So right now, if you're in Europe, the single biggest political issue is Brexit. Okay, we're down to something like 18 days to go to when um, Britain will exit the European Union. Um, now, that doesn't affect you or me or somebody else on a day-to-day -day basis, but it has significant potential impact for businesses. So 
I, I suppose to put it in a scale, the European Union is a market of 500 million people. Britain is a market of, let's say, 60 million people. So the 500 million people market we have is going to shrink to 440 for everybody who stays within the European Union, which is Ireland and, and you know 26 other countries. Um, for Britain, a business in Britain, instead of it being part of a market of 500 million, it's now going to shrink to a market of 60 million. And why is that important? Well, that's important for a number of businesses. And I'm not sure whether you have seen some of these headlines, but some of the car companies, for example, have strongly indicated that, you know, they have plants and employ thousands upon thousands of workers in the UK building cars for Europe. Well, you know, what they're saying is, well, they with this uncertainty over Brexit, they can't afford to commit more investment into the UK. And in fact, it's likely some of them will pull out significantly. They've already made some decisions. So Nissan, for example, has already decided that it's not going to make a, a, a particular model of its cash car or something in the UK anymore. They're going to make it elsewhere, which is a significant blow to the economy in the UK. And that's just car companies. So what's happening in the external environment that affects our business? Are there economic factors? So, you know, interest rates. So what's happening in the US? As Donald Trump continues, uh, the US economy, um, while it was growing, who knows why it was growing, was it to do with the policies Obama put in place? Was it the tax cut that, uh, that Trump brought in, which you know benefited certain groups, but not all groups? Um, but it's starting to stutter, okay? Uh, and what that means is that that could have implications for interest rates, it could have implications for unemployment in the US, it could have implications for demand in the US and into the US. So, you know, the US buys products from elsewhere around the world. What does that mean for products that are produced in Malaysia, in China, in Ireland, that go to the US if the US economy is having difficulties? So it's understanding what sort of factors are out there in the external environment that could affect our business. So we could talk about social, or we could talk about technology. Technology is another key one, obviously. And the whole data protection thing, GDPR in the in Europe uh, is starting to impact on the States. Um, but also, you know, the whole explosion of social media. So it is it has implications down here in terms of technology because we can do so much more instantaneously. And it also has implications for what we know and how we interact with people. So understanding what's going on in the external environment and how that it could impact on our business is really, really important. It doesn't mean that there's, there's a whole range of factors under every single one. Depending on your business, there may be no political impact or opportunities. Um, the environment, well, maybe it affects everybody with climate change. Uh, but so there may be factors or may not be factors under any one of these settings that could affect our business. But it's important to consider if there are and if the, we do identify them, well, what is the implication that that could have on our marketing plan, on our marketing research? And the example I sometimes talk about here is, when did you last buy a newspaper? So... 10, 15 years ago, I would have bought a newspaper at least once a week, okay? 10 years before that, probably three, four, five times a week. You know, certainly on a Sunday, more than likely on a Friday, and possibly once or twice during the week as well. But I don't need to do that anymore. Why? Because I can get access to newspapers online. Now, it doesn't mean, so what it means is I don't have to buy a physical newspaper, Okay. And what we see is that newspaper circulations in terms of print volumes have been going down over the last, uh, something like the last 13 or 14 years. Every year bar one, there's been negative impact on newspaper circulation uh, in the US. The picture, by the way, is, uh, there's no prize for guessing, although maybe there should be. It's Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman in a movie from the 1970s called All the President's Men, which was about the two reporters, Robert Redford playing Bob Woodward, who you see on CNN now and then, and Dustin Hoffman playing Carl Bernstein, who you see on CNN occasionally, who were the reporters who broke Watergate, which brought down Nixon. Um, and that was a newspaper story. Of course, we don't have newspapers anymore, so we don't have the same sort of implications. We have cable news, we have satellite news, we have Facebook. And that's where some of the difficulties are, because now our news is shaped by the algorithms that exist in the background. So the question fundamentally is, when did you last buy a newspaper? Goes to the technology change that's influencing the social change in the environment. So, you know, that would certainly impact it here in the, in the Pestel. We might also then look at the industry rivalry. So within our industry, 
So not just the macroeconomic factors that are outside. What are the things that are happening in our industry in terms of, you know, the suppliers and the buyers? Who has the power? If we have lots of buyers, individual buyers don't have power. If we have lots of suppliers, individual suppliers don't have power. If there are two suppliers that we rely on, those suppliers have power and they can exert influence on our industry. In addition, of course, in our industry, in our marketplace, we have competition. And that's where we might have some significant forces at play that we need to be aware of. Or we may not. If there's no one big player and there's lots of small players, while there might be, you know, good competition in our industry or in our market, there's no oppressive competition that could really squeeze a small or medium-sized player uh, being squeezed by, by a big player. But we also need to be aware of potential entrants and potential substitutes. You know, who are the potential entrants that could enter our industry uh, with a who could come in as new players and try to take market share away from us or from other providers? And what potential substitutes are out there for our business? In terms of that, actually, as they develop, there's no need for our customer for our customer to buy from us anymore. So uh, potential substitutes are quite interesting. So, you know, Facebook is a potential substitute for a newspaper. There's no doubt about it. They don't need to enter the news business, but the fact is people are sharing bits and pieces on Facebook. So more and more people are getting their news from Facebook. So it's a potential substitute in some way, okay? So we really need to understand our macro and our micro environment in order to understand much more about our customer and about the impact on our customer and then about the impact in terms of how our customer could be satisfied if not by us by somebody else so there are a number of decision making tools that the learning objective sort of refers to um so for example an unsoft matrix or a bcg matrix so if i just go back for a second right and i say you know if our objective here is to oops there we go Identify how selected organizations use marketing research to develop a marketing plan. We've got to figure out, well, what's the research and what are the tools that we use? Well, we have to start with uh, our external environment and work our way in. You've got to start with the Pestel. Then you've got to look at that sort of industry element, which is Michael Porter's five forces model. And then we might look at, well, okay, how else can we look at our industry or our market or our segment in a way that makes sense. And so the Igor Ansoff matrix is a useful one in this regard. Now what Ansoff talked about was, if you like, generic strategies. Now we'll talk about Porter's generic strategies again, but not, 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 not now. But Ansoff's idea was, that, look, if we have a product in an existing market, okay? So up here, if we have a product here, Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me let me raise that and that. Let me do it a, a, a square instead. If we have a product here, okay, what we're looking for is market penetration. We have an existing product or an existing service, and we're in an existing market. Um, we're looking to penetrate that market. We're looking to grow within that marketplace. Okay. If we talk about a product, uh, a new product into an existing market, we're talking about coming up with a strategy that allows us to develop a product, so product development, okay? If we're talking about a new product in a new market, well, this is something new to our business. We're talking about diversification, going out and doing something that we're not used, we, we don't have experience in this market, it's a new market to us, and we have to develop a new product. Whereas alternatively, if we have an existing product, but we can then move that to a new market, that's called market development. So these are the four sort of core strategies that Ansoff identified in terms of making decisions about markets and products. So if we have an existing product and we can take that existing product into an existing marketplace, we're talking about creating a market penetration strategy. And what that means is competing and taking market share off of somebody else. Now, if we apply this with something called the BCG matrix or some other matrix, and we look at that market and the market is growing, it's easier to penetrate that market 
Because if the market is growing, it's easier to take market share because everybody's getting a share, every share is growing, and it's easier to take a piece out than if it's not growing. If the market is contracting, it means somebody else is losing money, and now they're we're going to try and take more out of their uh, market, out of their segment. So that's a very, very difficult uh, uh, piece to deal with. In addition, you'd have to ask yourself, well, why, why would we want to be penetrating a contracting market? We're just getting to something that's going to get smaller over time. On the other hand, if it's an existing market and it's an attractive market because it's growing and we don't have an existing product, well, maybe we need to look at a new product development into that marketplace. So I always think that car companies are a really useful example in this space. Because if you look at a Volkswagen or a Toyota or a Nissan or a Mercedes, they have lots of different product models. And what they've done is they've identified that there are markets and there are segments within those markets. And those segments can be treated as you know, new markets in, in themselves. And if they don't, if they're not competing in a segment of the marketplace, they may well come up with a new variation on a car to penetrate or to, to develop a product into that marketplace. And I think if you look at how cars have developed over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, we've had, traditionally we had a sort of a small car, a medium car, and a large car or a luxury car. And we sort of expanded that whole range. So as the as things have changed, and it's like a variation on the ends of matrix, you know, companies have created new markets or split markets into different pieces and produce products for those new or those split segments. Uh, so things like a crossover vehicle, okay, or a or a subcompact, or a or a or, or the growth of hatchbacks, or you know, um, or the growth of off road off road vehicles, uh, four by fours. Um, you had, I suppose, one of the first big changes was the uh, the MPV. The you know the the multi-purpose vehicle where which is basically like a minivan, uh, and this was a sort of a cross between a medium car and a and a and a, and a, and a van, uh, and it was targeted at a new market segment which was really for urban uh, female drivers. So it was a new product development into a uh, an existing market, but a market that then got sort of uh, split or, or split off. So ants off. It's really useful. I'm not saying there's only four strategies here by any means. That's not the answer. But it's about looking at the market in such a way that you can identify, well, okay, it's not just taking this and putting it into this market. It's figuring out what's the right fit. What does the what does the market look like? What do we have? What does what are the needs in the market? And what do we have or what can we develop for that market? So it's a decision making tool that helps us work out exactly where we're going. Um, another tool is the BCG matrix. So and this uh, is similar to Ansoff in some ways in terms of like it's a four quadrant piece, but it's about looking at market growth rate and relative market share. So instead of having sort of a, a penetration or a diversification strategy, it's about looking at well what do we got in, what do we got in the marketplace and do we do we still want to be in this market? So if the market growth rate is high, that's a positive. If our market share is high, that's a positive. But if our market share, our relative market share in the marketplace is low, and the market growth rate is low, so we're down here in this segment here, okay, we would refer to that as a dog, okay? Uh, small market share, no growth prospects. You've got to ask yourself, why are we in this market, Okay. So at this case, we shouldn't be putting any investment into this because the market's not growing. The market is like, if it's a slow growth rate in the market, it's unlikely the market is going to significantly turn around. Um, and we're a small player in the marketplace, so we're never going to be able to compete with the big players in the marketplace. On the other hand, if we have a product or a service in a market which has a high growth rate and which we have a relatively high market share, you know, we, we're, we're setting the tone. We get to drive that business. Uh, so we would call that something uh, like a star product, okay? So certainly the Apple iPhone would have been a star product because the Apple iPhone, if you step back to this here, so Apple wasn't in the phone market, the, the mobile phone market. So it was a new market for Apple. 
they didn't have an existing product, so they diversified from computers into the phone market. They built on a product they had developed, which was the portable music player, the iPod. So they adapted that and became market development for them. And as a result, they built up a very strong position. So they had a, they had a, it, it became the smartphone market. So it's not a mobile phone market, it became the smartphone market. And they had a very high market share in that marketplace. Um, so they had a high market share down here and the smartphone was a very high growing market. So for quite a while, the Apple iPhone was the driver of Apple's share price because because they were such a big player in this market that they helped create, they had a real star product. They were making lots of money on the back of that. Okay, so it was a real star product, right? Um, and what's happened now is over time, of as, as does happen, other people like Samsung come into that marketplace and they start to take away some of the share because it's easier to get share in a growing market. Uh, and over time, the iPhone will have become a more normal competitor in some regards because it's competing against the Huawei. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Um, and of course, the Samsung and a few other uh handheld makers um but the iphone is really coming down here towards being a cash cow where they you know they still have a very high market share the market growth rate is probably slowed a fair bit so it's no longer a high growth market um but it's definitely they're down here in the cash cow market okay and in the cash cow segment uh i suppose if you were to think about nokia nokia owned nokia had 56 percent of the mobile phone market in the 90s and it got hammered because it didn't understand some of the technology changes you know and it didn't live with those changes that started to occur so it got pushed completely out of its own market uh, by by the iphone um up here if we've got a high growth rate and a low market share you've got to ask yourself do we want to stay in this market and try and push left into being a, a star product or do we just kill it off and let it die naturally and let it drop down to being a dog uh, and just milk it for profits for some other business OK, so again, this is another tool for us to start to look at our market, to do our market research, to do our marketing research, to work out where we go from here. Because if you look at this slide, you've got to ask yourself the question, where is the room in the, in, in the world at this stage? So what this slide shows, and you know, you'll have to download it and zoom in yourselves, is these are all sort of food brands. OK, probably it's more American than anything else, although there's all the European brands in here. But these are all different food brands ranging from confectionery to drinks to toiletries, etc. And it's showing the relative ownership. So if you look in the center, what you see is Kraft, Coca-Cola, Nestle, PepsiCo, P&G. Uh, I think that's General Electric. Um, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, Kellogg's, Mars, Unilever and Johnson & Johnson. Those are the companies that own all of these brands. And they have different strategies for different brands. So if you look at Procter & Gamble, it's got all these products down here in different markets and different segments, and it will have different strategies. Obviously, some will be similar, but different strategies and approaches for each of those marketplaces, as will Unilever, as will Kellogg's, as will Coca-Cola. What's really interesting to me is that while Coke is a bigger company, in some ways, PepsiCo has many more brands. It's in more businesses than Coca-Cola. So in that space, if we're trying to figure out, you know, what we have, where we want to be, what, where we want to compete in the marketplace, bearing in mind, you know, we're going to have to keep in touch with our customers, and understand what their needs are and everything else. We've got to figure out this is, this is, this is where we compete. This is where we have to find a way to stand out, to make our product stand up, to find a market and a customer whose needs are not being met and so that we can then drive and develop a solution for those customers and for those needs. Okay. I'm going to talk about Owlet in a minute. This was the second video. Now, I can't show this to you now because of the problem that earlier on, but I'll come back to this in, in, in a couple of minutes and we'll sort of, maybe we'll close with that. But let, let me just talk again about market research and marketing research. There is a slight difference. In one sense, you think, it's not radical, okay? But it's important just to understand what the slight difference is, and then we can drill down into, into what we need to know from, from this learning objective. Market research can be defined as the process of gathering, analyzing, and interpreting information about a market, about a market, about a product or a service, 
which can be offered for sale in the market, and about the past, present, and potential customers. So that's primarily about a market and about the customers in the market and about the product or services that we're thinking of offering in this market. So that's the market research. Marketing research can be defined as the process of finding out about the market as well. So the same thing here to here, okay? In which the firm hopes to succeed and assessing all aspects of the firm's marketing strategies and tactics. So marketing research is understanding what we're going to do from a marketing perspective to be effective in this market. Market research is about understanding what it's going to take, if you like, to be successful. So what is the market? Where is it? What are the products and services that are there and that we're hoping to offer? Uh, and what do customers want? And then marketing research is much more about, well, what are we going to do about that? Okay. So we might talk about under marketing research, we might talk about cons customer research or advertising research or product research or distribution or sales or environment research. So what we're really talking about here is understanding much more about these elements in the marketplace and in the approach to marketing. So for example, advertising research, well, where, where will our customers get our advertising? Where, where is the best place for us to put an advertisement for this product? Or this service. So if I'm selling golf balls or golf clubs, you know, it's unlikely to be productive for me to advertise to teenage boys and girls. One, because golf is a, a sport that's, yeah, well, there are some kids playing golf. There are many more adults, you know, younger, middle-aged in particular, and older middle-aged adults playing golf. So therefore, the advertising to those people who are the vast bulk will be in ways that's appropriate to them as opposed to somebody who's, you know, 15. So instead of me looking at an Instagram post, I need to consider well, possibly Facebook, but also magazine advertising, right? And advertising maybe around television shows or radio shows or other media that those people will be absorbing. So who is our customer and how do we advertise them? What's the best bang for our book in terms of advertising research? Okay. Now, you guys may be familiar with uh, Google Analytics, okay, or other social media analytics in terms of understanding how that might work. And we will talk a little bit about this. But this whole idea that, you know, understanding, well, if we're looking at our Google searches and we're looking at our search terms and our visiting pages and everything and all sort of analysis, this is why Google makes a fortune and why Facebook makes money. Because they're able to turn around and say, you know what, if you define your parameters, we can place your advertisement to this particular, to the category of people that you're trying to reach in a way that you're trying to reach them. So you're looking for, you know, men or women who are 45 to 55, who are playing golf twice a week, who are interested in golf, therefore are likely to be interested in tennis or likely to be interested in politics or whatever. Okay. So they, they, they can do that sort of profiling and they can do that sort of tailoring so that you produce a message in a language or a mechanism appropriate, and it gets slotted to those people through their search or through their Facebook feeds or whatever, okay? And that's the, that's where Facebook and Google are making a fortune, okay, as, as is Instagram on, because they're getting into that sort of tailored social media, as opposed to the old days where, you know, you might put an ad out on television, which is seen by 500,000 people, and your actual segment is only 12,000 people, but you've got to get to 50 to 500,000 people just to get to those 12,000. Whereas what Google and Facebook can do is they can get you to those 12,000 in a much more cost-effective way. That's the idea. So we would look at customer research. We look at advertising research. We look at product research as well. What do people actually want? What are the USPs that affect them or that they really, um, really understand and really buy into or really resonates with them? Is distribution an issue? You know, is is delivery uh, a positive? Uh, do they need to come and... and, and touch or feel the product um what sales techniques work with them what pricing works with them so market re marketing research is about all of those elements and I, I, as i said i'll finish with the outlet story in a minute um if we look at the marketing research process you know it's a fairly straightforward process to identifying the problem what's the problem we're looking to solve you know what are the project objectives what's our research question 
we develop a research plan for that marketing research in terms of what's the information we need, uh, what are the methods we're going to use, who are the responsible parties. We conduct the research. Uh, we do secondary review, data reviews or desk research. We do primary data collection. So we might do focus groups. We might do surveys. Um, that data gets analyzed and we produce a report. And then we take some sort of action on that. And I think this is a really useful, it's a fairly straightforward process, but it's it's a process. And as a process, you've got to apply it. There's no point in just jumping in at point three or you know, not doing the grounding under point one and so on. You've got to follow the process. It doesn't mean you can't go back and revisit stages, but if you follow the process, you get a much better understanding and you can then produce a much better marketing response to that, which can really help your business. Okay. Um, and that then will help us with some sort of marketing plan. So, you know, where we're going to advertise, what that means for our branding, you know, is our branding right? Is it right for this market? Uh, do we need to do something on our branding? You know, do we need a little publicity? Is it, is it about getting the right champions in place? You know, that we want this football player or this pop star to be our endorser. Um, what does it mean for our pricing? You know, what should we do? Sales promotion in terms of having, you know, three for two. Should we be giving away free samples here? Should we be doing uh, free samples of traffic lights? You know, people walking up and down, handing stuff out to people to our drivers. Uh, do we product placement on media and in TV or movies? Do we do direct marketing? So what's the marketing plan that best fits the research that we've surfaced? So best, what's the marketing plan made of any of those, any or all of those elements that falls out of the market research, which helps us understand what we're about and who our customer is and what they want and where they're likely to get their message and where they're likely to buy. Um, because we've done this sort of marketing research here uh, and because we've done that sort of market research and now we're clear about the marketing research about how the interactions will work. Which brings me back to the outlet. So this was the second video I wanted to show you, okay? Uh, which is there. It's a, that's actually a, a business model competition that they won. But the outlet, um, in a nutshell, is a it's a warning device. It became this wearable sock for babies, and it used pulse ox technology, which is you know you see the thing these finger clips you see on patients in hospitals for measuring oxygen content. It used that technology in a little cuff that would goes on a newborn baby's ankle. Uh, and link that to technology so that if the baby stopped breathing, it sends a signal to your mobile phone. So as a parent, it was like a baby monitor, only it was wearable. So your normal, your other baby monitor, which is you're listening to, you know, you've got the little thing in your room, uh, a little microphone in the room on, the, on, a, on, a, on a wireless portable speaker downstairs. This thing was worn by the baby and provided this thing straight to your phone as the baby stopped breathing. Simple concept. Right now, the approach that these guys took to this is told in this video. They, they explain their process, and it hits a number of those things we've just talked about in terms of the market research. You know, figuring out what they had, what people wanted, where they should sell it, how they should sell it, what price they should charge, and it also explains how they changed their process and their attitude as they went along, as they learned from their marketing research. So for example, they started thinking that they were selling this to hospitals. What they found out really quickly was, well, nurses love this, hospital administrators weren't gonna buy it. They had all this other equipment. They weren't gonna spend a fortune on more equipment for their hospitals. So they changed. So they realized, okay, it's not hospitals, but actually it's new, it's parents who want this. So well, how do we sell this to parents and would they buy it? And then they talked to parents and they asked those sort of questions about parents in terms of understanding who they were and where they were, etc. So. I, I will get this link sent on to you, and I suggest that you look at both of those videos because they really illustrate the, the, the topic that we're trying to cover. Uh, and that's the marketing plan process. Uh, so we get a marketing plan out of these things. There's a process there, which I won't go into now, uh, which really is just going to help us determine what we apply in our marketing mix for our marketing plan. Okay, I hope that was of use. We will pick this up again next week, and I will see you. You again in a few minutes in the leadership lecture. Thank you.